Now, you have a story for us uh, about where you were at um, picking this series when the Bucks were up 2 nothing in this series. Now, I will tell you, I said, I said Raptors in six, but then they lost that game one, Mike, and I will admit, I was a little shaken. I'm like, that's probably the one they got to have. They're probably not going to win a game seven in Milwaukee, and I don't think they're going to win four straight. So how did you still have faith when it was 2 nothing Milwaukee? They got Kawhi Leonard. What do you mean? You know, <laughs> when, you, when you have such a dominant force on one team, an individual player that is that good, see – he not only demands double teams and he demands, but he also demands his teammates because of the level of highness that he plays at and with such a high IQ. If you watch the Toronto Raptors this season and if you watch them from the past, I, when in the game, Milwaukee went on a 7-0 run and then Kawhi scored the next two baskets. And then Milwaukee went on like another 9-0 run and then Kawhi had, he made a play for the next two or three baskets. See, in the past, Toronto never had a player that can stop runs. Mm -hmm. Now they have a player, when a team goes on an 8-0 run, 10-0 run, they have a player that can just say, give me the ball. You know, we're going to stop this run. And so when you have such a dominant force like that, you're always going to give yourself a chance at winning the game. And it's so interesting to watch him play because I feel like his game, you can kind of liken to a long-distance running event, right? You start out of the gate, you're slow and steady, you want to get off to a good start, but really you save your juice for down the stretch when you need to pull ahead. And that's kind of how I feel about Kawhi's game, trying to integrate his teammates early, seeing who's on and who's not, and then pulling up for however many in the fourth quarter when he's needed. You know what? I think that he just plays at one level of uh, speed, and he plays with such a high level of intensity that most of his teammates never played at that level of intensity before. And so now they look at how high of a level he's playing at, so they're forced to play at that level. It's almost like Michael Jordan taking Steve Kerr, John Paxson, Bill Cartwright, Horace Grant, and now you're saying this is a championship team. Mm -hmm. It's not that that's a championship team. It's just that they have pretty good pieces. You know, there's guys that can hit a three-pointer and there's guys that can make layups. But overall, there's one person that puts them in position to have a lot of these open looks. If you look at how Toronto plays, only thing they're really doing, Van Vliet, he's hitting open shots. It's not like he has to put the ball on the floor and make a play. It's not like Kyle Lowry really has to put the ball on the floor and make a play. These guys, Marcus Saul and them, all they have to do is dunk the ball, an open dunk, or an open jump shot. And that's because of the pressure that Kawhi puts on the defense. But Fred Van Vliet coming alive, you, you're right. You nailed it, Mike. He, that, that probably saved the series. You probably felt, you know, for Danny Green, uh, he could not make a shot those last four games and limited minutes. Uh, Nick Nurse gave him a little spin in the third quarter, but it's like a car there's something wrong with. He took him out for two or three minutes, back to the shop. He wasn't getting any more time after that. You, you know, this is the playoffs. So you can't go into the game with your, um, with your system that you wrote down with your game plan that you wrote down before the game and think that you're going to stick to that. Whatever and whoever is giving you the minutes and the effectiveness on the basketball court are the players that should be playing. You shouldn't be thinking about no contracts. I don't care mm -hmm. if it's a D-league call-up. Mm -hmm. Even if it's a D-league call-up, if this guy is out there playing ball, man, you better sit that guy making $20 million a game, $20 million a year, because it's not about nothing. The loser goes home. And at this point... This is for the Larry O'Brien trophy. So now it's even more critical and it's even more crucial. One of the things that I really liked about this performance from the Raptors is their resiliency, right? They go down double-digit leads for the Bucks, not once but twice in this game. And sometimes you get the feeling that you're making a run and you catch up, but you barely got there. Every point is so difficult. And then the team takes another two steps to get ahead of you. What's that like? Like you've played a ton of NBA basketball. There has to be a difference between making a run and feeling like it's coming easy versus making a run and feeling like, damn, if we make one mistake, the other team's just going to take off again. I mean, of course, it's, it's always about momentum. And a three-pointer, a dunk can change the momentum of the game just that fast. But... Sometimes you're in, such a, um, you're in such a hole that trying to dig yourself out of that hole, you fatigue, and you only had enough energy just to make the game a, a good game. But then there has to be a whole other level of wanting to win. See, this is when the desire, there's a difference between wanting to win and the desire to win and just want to be a participate and just play well. Mm -hmm.
You know, most people just want to play well and participate, and that's what you call front runners. Because when it gets hot in the kitchen, there's nothing inside of them that's going to make them des- the desire to win has um, it has wilted. But when there's those people that really, you know, those co- them competitors, those guys that are challenge you to. We can spin around in the chair. Hundred, who can get to a hundred the <laughs> fastest? I'll bet you a hundred dollars. Yeah. Those type of guys, you got to be scary with in competition because they're willing to compete and they want to win in everything. And I think that when you have guys like that on your team, you know, you never know where these guys can take you. This is the same exact team they had last year, other than Marcus Saul. Only one change has happened: one superstar to another superstar. But there's a difference in the way that they approach the game, not the way the talent and the skill level is DeMar DeRozan is a way more exciting player than uh, Kyrie Leonard is mm-hmm. you know what I mean I'd rather watch DeMar play he might do a 360 spinning underhand hook shot three or some spectacular play you're not going to see no spectacular plays from Kawhi Leonard but you're going to see an effectiveness on the game and that's the thing that means more than how pretty it looks it's not about pretty well, you don't get no extra points for pretty for style man I can't I cannot stand those competitive people that you're talking about if they're on my basketball team I'm here for it but if they're like who can fold this laundry faster <laughs> who can walk fast who can get in line faster yeah. it's just like no you go yeah. ahead you go right ahead yeah. It carries over. Competition carries over, not just in one thing. It carries over in everything in life. A winner wants to win, and a winner wants to win at everything. Mike James, our guest, did you change your mind about Giannis after this series? I I watched him. He didn't want to shoot jumpers, Mike, but he also didn't want to go to the line. That's a huge factor. It's one thing if if you're driving the basket and you know they're going to put you on the line 18, 20 times and you'll make the free throws. He didn't want to be at that free throw line on Saturday night. He didn't want to be there Thursday in front of his home crowd. You know, I think that even though uh, Giannis is a hard guard for anyone, but I think when Kawhi took that commitment on a defensive end, it changed Giannis' approach to the game. Because now you have someone, you know, just as strong as you, hands just as big as yours, Mm -hmm. arms probably just as long as yours, and someone just as tough as you that is now guarding you, but someone that loves to play defense. You know, there's not too many players in the NBA that love to play defense and still can dominate on the offensive end. I don't know too many players like that. They either are a really, really good defensive player and they're committed to defense and they don't play, they're not a really good offensive player. Are they a really good offensive player, but they fall asleep on the defensive end? So you never have a player that is able to be committed on both ends. And when he made that commitment to guard him, that's when the whole series changed. So let me ask you about being in the NBA Finals. And I, I have personal experience with this from 04. Before I remember it very well. Blinker. Yeah, well, I was kind of, <laughs> <laughs> Just... uh, But you're underdogs. You're heavy underdogs against Kobe, Shaq. And remember, for people who don't know, they added Gary Payton and Carl Malone as veterans. They're heavy favorites. They've got home advantage. Do you think every single Pistons player in 04 believed you could win that series? Oh, we thought we was going to sweep them. Why? We knew. We knew that they one one we was one we was the best defensive team in the NBA that year, and it was hard for teams to score on us. And two, we had a lot of offensive weapons, but you know the way Larry Brown put the system together, you know we everyone everyone believed in his system, and everyone conformed their games to you know what I mean. Take away yeah. from their own individuals. So now we can have one common goal, and that's winning the championship. But you had a lot of offensive threats on one team. You had a dominating bench. When the, In order to win a championship, it's not the starting five. It's your bench. You know, guys have to come up and guys have to step up. You know, you need somebody like a Van Vliet that's going to give energy when there's no energy, when a Danny Green doesn't step up. So now that's the thing that made us different was, okay, Kobe, you're going to have a great game. Shaq, you're going to have a great game. But ain't nobody else going to play well. We strapping up everybody else. Everybody else going to have, like, Derek Fisher had, like, two points. In the, he averaged, like, two points for the series. The most another player averaged in that series was, like, five. You're right. I'm, I'm, than, looking, I'm looking at this as we're talking. Shaq had 26.6 points per game. Kobe had 22.6. And you beat them in five games because five of your players had double digits. That's what you're yeah. telling me is let the two superstars get theirs. Can can Toronto do that with the Splash Brothers? If there's no Durant, can they let Steph Curry basically have every look he wants, or is that too much and, and they'll get murdered if they do that? I think Kyle Lowry, you know, Kyle Lowry's problem 
is never the defensive end. Kyle Lowry's problem has always been he falls asleep on the offensive end and he shy away from the big shot and he and now all of a sudden he'll have one of those horrible shooting percentages. But you never question his defense. You never question his help side, give taking charges. He's one of the best charge takers in the NBA. Yeah. And he's one of the better on-ball players on the ball as far as playing defense one-on-one. So now that limits Steph's easy touches. you got another guard that's going to fight and that's going to be willing to fight with him. But the problem is not going to lie in that. The problem, Steph is one of the – he's the first team all NBA for a reason. You know, he's a heck of a player. That's not the problem. The problem is going to be who guards Kawhi. Mm-hmm. And now if if Clay Thompson is guarding Kawhi, that takes away from his offense now because he has to now use – he has to exert even more energy on the defensive end to try to guard him for a whole possession and then turn around and run around screens and chase after the ball. Like that's going to be hard for him, I think, for him to be able to concentrate on both ends. He's a good defensive player, but he doesn't commit to the defensive end like that. And I think that's going to take away from his game. And if Clay and Steph doesn't have big – games together they're a different team um you don't especially without kd you don't think though that dre and iggy could probably give them a few fits and then they're not people that really are counted on for their offense as much i don't think that i don't i don't think that iguodala and um and i think draymond too big to guard uh Mm kawhi and i think he's gonna get him in foul trouble and the only other person that can defend him will be kevin durant and uh clay thompson and Mm -hmm. if kevin durant is there I think it's going to be difficult for anybody to guard him one-on-one. Now it's up to his teammates to step up, knock down shots, and hit open layups. Okay, I have a question for you, and I heard it made waves amongst your your social circle. And you're not just saying this because you're on a Canadian radio station. You think the Raptors can win this series against the Warriors? Oh, I almost got into a fight in the, um, in the gym one day. They were talking. You know how when you finish the conversation like 30 minutes early prior and then all of a sudden you just hear somebody say, I can't believe he just said that like 30 <laughs> minutes later. Yeah. Like it was one of those days that, you know, when they went home and thought about it, they still brought it up. Like I should punch Mike in the face for saying it. <laughs> but when Toronto was down two one against to Milwaukee, I made the statement that Toronto was going to win this series and Toronto was going to beat um, Golden State in six. It almost seems inconceivable. It almost seems inconceivable, honest to God. And I support the Raptors, and I love what they've done, but it just seems like something out of a storybook. And one of the things we were talking about before as well, and I don't mean to 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 get you to put someone else's words in your mouth, but what do you think DeMar DeRozan is feeling like today, watching his squad, a team that he grew up with, a team that he got traded away from, become an NBA Finals contender, something he just wasn't able to do for them? What do you mean? San Antonio got knocked out in the first round this year. And I don't think, and I think that if San Antonio had Kawhi this year, they'll probably be in the West. They'll probably would have lost in the Western Conference Finals to, uh, <laughs> to uh, Golden State. Mm-hmm. You, you know, and so it's just the difference of players. It's one player. I look at it even this week when they practice and getting ready, you know, for this, for this championship. I'm pretty sure the people in Toronto are giddy and excited and happy. But you know what? When they in practice, they got a player on their team that ain't going to entertain that giddiness, that excitement, and that happiness. Mm-hmm. They got somebody that's going to be like, hey, guys, come on, quit playing. Let's get this stuff done. Yeah. They got somebody that's a serious. Instead of playing the music with them and dancing with them, he going to come in there, turn the radio off, throw the radio to the ground, and be like, y'all bullcrap, and let's go. And ain't no one going to get mad at him for doing it, and they all going to and they all going to come behind him. They got a real leader behind Kawhi, even though he may not say much. His leadership is not in his words. His leadership is in his approach to the game, and that's what they're following. They're following. They're taking on his personality and his attitude. Even Pascal, he's taking on Kawhi's attitude mm-hmm. on the court. It's they true. They are. Super, they have no approach. swagger. This team. Like, when you think about coming to the games, dressed to the nines, like, talking out their neck or anything like that, this team does not do anything like that. And I think you're right. It's because of Kawhi Leonard and his leadership and Kyle Lowry to an extent. Yeah, they took on his personality. I believe they took on Kawhi's personality in Toronto. And I think that's the thing that's showing his leadership.